Welcome to Insight Analog Photography Radio Program. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and of course, the Insight Analog Photography Radio Program is all about traditional process photography. We talk about instant photography. We talk about black and white. We talk about color film. We talk about dry plate, wet plate, you name it, alternate printing processes, everything going on in analog photography. And of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. They have beautiful C41 color neg, black and white, color chrome, and of course, instant. Instant film rocks. These guys have so much great things going on right now with instant film. Of course, they have the pack film in three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five. Color, black and white, high speed black and white, but you know what's even cooler? They have the Instex cameras and film. The Instex Wide is in the country, available everywhere. And of course, right now, brand new, the Instex Mini is now in the U.S. They have cameras. They have film. This Instex Mini is two and a half by three and a half. It's the size of a business card. This is really fun stuff. You got to check it out. www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab, the places in all your film to get developed, proofs, you name it. They got a great workflow going. www.richardphotolab.com, DR5. For the most unbelievable proprietary process to turn your black and white film into positives, into chrome. You won't believe until you get your film back as a piece of chrome will blow your mind. The dynamic range, the latitude, it's just unbelievable stuff. Definitely check it out. www.dr5.com. Iger Studios. Lenny Iger, the place to have high-resolution scans done. You know, a lot of people now are shooting analog. They're using a high-resolution scan. They're making digital negatives on an inkjet. Or maybe they're going straight to an inkjet output. But they're making digital negatives and they're printing contact prints. They're doing all the stuff you need to get a high resolution scan. They're using an Aztec Premier, 8,000 PPI, adjustable aperture. They can give you scans that are basically grain free. They can adjust it for every kind of film out there. This is crazy stuff going on with Lindy Iger and the guys at Iger Studios. Check them out, igerstudios.com. And of course, Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. The camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder. Our media partners www.apug.org, the analog photography user group, the place on the web for all things analog process. This is a great place to learn, to share information, to get tips and tricks, the community for analog photography, www.apug.org, and of course, our photographic philanthropy partner, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film, www.geh.org, the place to go to find out about the history of traditional analog photography. These people are keeping this alive. They have over 7,000 cameras in their museum of everything that's ever been made, including the Hasselblads that were shot on the moon. You name it. They have the collection. This is a great way to help support. You can be a member of George Eastman House organization. They have a lot of great things going on, but this is something you can do to help give back to photography, to help keep traditional analog photography alive for generations to come. Definitely check them out, www.geh.org. On today's Inside Analog Photo, we're going to have with us Joseph Cruz. Joseph is a fine art photographer from Canada that specializes in the Canadian Rockies. This is unbelievable photography. You definitely got to check out his website. We're going to find out today how he got into this, how he does it. And I'm telling you, when you see these photographs, it's going to blow you away. I don't know how he even gets these locations, but we're going to find out. This is great stuff. Joseph, how you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great, Scott. Thank you for having me on the program. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. Great to feature you on the show and just beautiful photography you're doing out in the middle of nowhere. This is really (laughs) cool landscape and how you've been able to capture the essence of the Canadian Rockies. This is unbelievable stuff. Well, thank you. So, Joseph, tell me, you do photography. Is this a full-time gig? Is this something that you're just out trekking in the backwoods all the time? Tell me about Joe a little bit. Sure. Well, I reside in Calgary, Alberta, and basically I'm 45 minutes from the Canadian Rockies. So I live next door to quite a vast wilderness region. It's basically untouched. It's largely uninhabited. And within this region, there are four national parks, a half a dozen or so provincial parks, which are then further surrounded by numerous wildland preserves. In total, the area is probably the equivalent of a small European country. And this is a region that is, in my mind, just of outstanding beauty. In fact, four of the national parks, Banff, Jasper, Cooney, and Yoho, and three of the provincial parks, Hamber, Mount Robson, and Assiniboine, have been declared World Heritage Sites. So they're protected by the United Nations as places of outstanding universal value. And that's been my stomping ground for about the past 25 years. 
And I started out basically by hiking and climbing in the backcountry. And I would carry with me Pentax 35mm camera. And this was one of those early Pentax cameras that basically had aperture priority. And that was the key feature of that specific body. I loaded that camera with Kodachrome. And I just shot Kodachrome on all these trips. That's when I started to learn about photography, really just shooting as I went. Over time, I had people express interest in some of the work that I had done. So I externally made Cibachromes, and I had some success at selling these. So that was how I started with photography. One day, I happened to see an Ansel Adams calendar in the local bookstore, and I decided that I was going to buy another body, and I was going to start shooting black and white. Lo and behold, at the camera store, I got talked into buying a Pentax 67. Later, I traded that in for a 672. Then I started shooting Valvia, and I shot that for about five years. Later on, I started doing my own Cibachrome, and I was able to acquire my own enlarger. I also bought a Chobo processor from a local film lab, and that came with a whole bunch of reels and drums and all kinds of things. I had no idea what the stuff was for at the time. I just shelved it, and I just started to teach myself how to do Cibachrome. I was doing that for a number of years, and I was selling some prints, and I had a fair bit of success following that path. And I started to get into contrast masks and further kind of learn Cibachrome printing. Then one day, again, I was pretty easily sold. I got talked into buying a 4x5 Toyo. And I carried that camera around until I ended up trading that in for a Linhoff Master Technica. That's been my primary camera ever since. So my primary focus has always been landscape photography. I've done some commercial work, such as interiors, exteriors. I do some portrait work. I've drifted away from a lot of that commercial work recently just because it's taken away from my true passion, which is being outside and capturing these landscapes. So really, the whole photography gig and what you've been doing here with your fine art stuff really came about from your love of just going out in the wild and trekking about here in the middle of nowhere. Well, that's correct, and I had the pleasure of exploring some really unique places. And in my mind, I've always wanted to kind of go back to those areas and capture them with a big camera. So, as I mentioned, I'm drawn to that landscape. I don't tend to shoot leaves floating on ponds or abstract patterns or things like that. What I really like is finding that place where there's a giant mountain that might be snow-capped. There's a beautiful stream. There's some lavish forest and meadows. And I'm looking for that jaw-dropping vista. And that's been the focus of my work so far. Yeah, I mean, you can just tell, and I haven't even dug deep into the black and white stuff, but even on the color images, that the stuff is just unbelievable, and it's in the middle of bloody nowhere. It doesn't look like you pulled up in the station wagon and clicked off a few and left. The time that I'm shooting adds to that. A lot of the images that are color, for example, are shot in the spring. And in the springtime here, there's a brief window where there's new growth emerging on the trees. Specifically, the western and the alpine larches, they have this beautiful shade of green. And when you get the right mix of stormy weather, that kind of clearing pattern, it really makes for a lovely color photograph. And so I'm trying to capture that moment where the storm is starting to clear, the ground is damp because it has rained for a number of hours, all that vegetation is damp and it's really saturated. And during those times, those landscapes just have a very dramatic look to them. Similarly, in the fall, you often find, especially in the alpine meadows, the colors start to change up high. The mountains in the background are often draped with fresh snow. That's another time of the year that I'm out there shooting quite extensively. At the same time, there are trees that grow in certain parts of the range called alpine larches. And this is an evergreen tree, which amazingly turns from green to yellow, and then it sheds its needles. And these trees tend to grow in large groups. So you often come across these extensive stands of golden evergreen trees, and they are really beautiful to shoot. And I like to capture these images when the trees are at their peak color, when the first kind of winter snows have blanketed that land in white. And of course, the mountains are draped in fresh snow in the background, and there's some drama in the sky because there's so much moisture in the air. So trying to get that combination right is what I really hunt for. And there are many years like this year where it just didn't come together. Last year didn't come together, but the year before it did. And when you're out there and everything is coming off, You pull it off, and you really get quite a lovely landscape as a result. I mean, like you said, you have to pack into this stuff. So let's say you're a 45-minute or an hour drive away just to get to one of these parks. But I got a feeling some of the places that you've been shooting here isn't right off the beaten path on top of it. So how far do you have to truck in with how much gear? 
Uh, it depends. Some of the areas are fairly accessible by trail. On average, when I'm carrying my full 4x5 kit, I'm looking at probably a four-hour walk into a place. Sometimes it's that plus an overnight as well. So areas like Yoho in that national park, for example, that's probably eight miles in, and then you're basically camping overnight, and then the following morning you're going up into the Alpine, and that's where a lot of those larches can be found. In my early days, I'd drive up and down the highway, and I did some of that shooting from my vehicle. But since that time, I've kind of ventured more into the backcountry. And oftentimes, it's four or five hours walking at night, getting to a point and setting up and just waiting for the right moment. No, like I said, people really need to go to your website and look at the images because it's just stunning work. And some of these pictures, it's incredible how do you even express what you see when you're looking at this stuff. It's almost like you're feeling like you're part of the Donner Party and you're done. It just conveys in the image that you're out in the middle of nowhere, brother, and I mean nowhere. We are certainly blessed with such an extensive region that's undeveloped. And one of the other things I really enjoy shooting is those early winter shots. And my black and white photography focuses on that primarily. And right after a new snowfall, you get this quality of the snow. And I think it's something to do with the crystals. I don't know if they're very angular, but they really have an intensity to them. And that really adds a lot to the photos. Because once you capture that glistening white and you've got the clouds forming up in the mountains in the background, it really gives the landscape a really dramatic impact. No, the stuff's stunning. It's beautiful work. So let's go back to color here. You're still shooting color, correct? That's correct. Now you're shooting everything with the Linhoff now. So you're going to go out with a bunch of color, a box of black and white, just in case. Do you know what you're going to do? I know you're going to go out tonight. You're going to actually head out this evening go deep where nobody's gone before probably or not many <laughs> well i'm gonna probably pack black and white one of the things that i look for is the clearing storm kind of atmosphere the last two days it has been snowing in the mountains and it's expected to clear tomorrow that's the forecast i mean things could change when you get there you never know because of the time of year right now i'm gonna be packing mostly black and white i probably carry about 20 sheets of black and white film i carry the linhoff of course and usually bring about three or four lenses I have a Nikon 90F8, a Schneider 110 Super Samar XL, which is an absolutely fabulous piece of glass. I've got a Schneider 150 and a Nikon 210. And then I will bring a 6x12 roll film back in case there's an image that lends itself to that aspect. I won't bring any graduated filters because I'm not shooting color. Just basically my black and white kit. And of course, lots of insulated clothes, good nice warm jacket, hat and glove and so forth. Well, I guess if people don't know, you're in Calgary, Alberta. You're like Yellowstone North. It's like there's nothing there, man. Well, yeah, we are fairly isolated. That is true. But again, that's kind of the charm of the area. Right? Well, sure. I mean, look at the images you're grabbing. Also, do you take like a sat phone with you? Do you go by yourself? Do you have someone with you as a spot or a helper? Or is this a one-man gig? Well, I haven't been able to convince anybody to <laughs> join me on these trips, surprisingly enough. One of the things I do carry, if I'm going into an area that might be not well-defined by a trail network, or if it's winter and I'm skiing in, in the night, I mean, it's very easy to lose your trail. So I have a Garmin GPS, and I'll plan my route with the Topo Canada software, and I'll use that as a backup in case I get lost. I have been lost, and I've had to wait till sunrise to kind of figure out where I'm going, but that's kind of my backup. Traveling by night by yourself is probably not the smartest thing to be doing, but like I said, unfortunately, I haven't been able to recruit any volunteers to join me on these trips. <laughs> what about hungry animals? I mean, are you getting chased by bears and moose and crazy things in the night, or is that <laughs> well, pretty mellow? It is bear country, as you point out. This year, I've seen one black bear. Last year, I came across two grizzlies. In all those cases, there's been no confrontation. The grizzlies I, view, I was able to view from a very safe distance, so I was quite safe. When you see two eyeballs they're reflected on your headlamp at night, you hope it's something small. Yeah, those animals do exist out there. And one of the strangest things that ever happened was in Kootenai Park last year, I was traveling up an old track road in the middle of the night, winter, and I thought I saw a dog. And as I got closer, uh, this thing is just way too big to be a dog. It turned out to be a wolf. And she was just kind of standing there, and I stood there and I watched her for a couple minutes. Then she started leading me down the cart path. And this is kind of weird. It's almost like she wanted me to follow her. So I'm not sure what kind of behavior that was from that animal or what she was trying to lead me away from, but it was kind of a really cool experience. Wow, I guess so. She hooked you up. Well, I mean, really, I'm sure they don't see a lot of people. 
Yeah, and the bears, as you can imagine, they're very unpredictable. And I mean, that is a real risk of traveling in bear country. And the National Park Service here does a pretty good job of posting warnings. They track bear activity, so you can find out where they are, what they're doing, and you kind of stay away from those areas. In the past, I used to go in on a mountain bike riding at night. I stopped doing that because the odds of spooking a bear are quite high. And carrying 40 pounds on your back on a mountain bike is not exactly a fun ride anyway. So I've kind of had to get smartened up a little bit in the way I travel. Yeah, hopefully you're taking some weapons with you too, I would think. Well, they're not allowed, unfortunately. And the only thing you can carry is bear spray, which is a pepper spray. And nine times out of ten, I actually forget the stuff. And when you do see evidence of a bear, especially at times when they're feeding on berries, you just turn around and go home. It's just not worth the confrontation because they will defend that area quite vigorously. Wow. So what do you like to shoot for color stock? For color, I'm primarily using Astia. Obviously, it's the 4x5 sheet film. Yep. And I love the color gamut of that film. It's a very nice film to scan. Its grain pattern is really delicate. And I also like the way that it holds highlights. I think that it has actually greater dynamic range than Velvia. I haven't tested it. I've not charted it or anything. But I do just anecdotally feel that I'm able to get a little bit more dynamic range with that film. So the color chrome film, that's my primary stock right now. Are you still printing Zebra Chromes? No. Actually, I got away from Zebra Chrome during probably the last four years. There was a time when Ilford was in some financial difficulty, and it was very difficult to get the paper. And I believe they ended up offloading that division to another company. I was receiving orders or getting requests for prints, and I wasn't able to produce anything. And that's when I switched to a hybrid workflow. And I went out and I bought an Epson 7800, and I spent about a year and a half trying to figure out how to make prints on that printer. And so I'm using that today as my primary output. And I've also, from time to time, sent out prints to be produced on that Fuji gloss paper. The Fuji Chrome paper, the Fuji Super Gloss, it's very cool. I mean, it's close to a Siva Chrome, and as you well know, a Siva Chrome is very unique. It has a fantastic look to it. But what I found frustrating with Cibachrome was its inconsistency from batch to batch. So every time you got a new batch of paper, you have to do a lot of testing to get your enlarger dialed in. Right. And because I shoot a lot of images that have white, I had a real hard time kind of eliminating the cast from the white in the Cibachrome prints. So certainly the Epson and the new digital technology has made that a lot easier. Right, but you've still found that you're getting your best image capture on an analog piece of film. Absolutely. I do have a Contact 645 with a Phase 1 back, and there's a lot of headache, quite honestly, in using that device with the images that I'm capturing, especially the landscapes. And as you know, the highlights tend to be very tricky to bring down with that back. And I'm also finding that the color gamut that that device can capture is quite wide, and it has a hard time kind of translating into the printer's gamut. Whereas I know when I'm shooting Astia that if I scan it, I'm going to have a pretty easy time of rendering that piece of film to a print. And so I've just found that I've had less challenges working with Astia. So Joe, working with all this great chrome, tell me, have you had any chance to shoot any color neg? I have recently tested the Ektar 120 version, and I've found that to be quite a nice film to work with. Unfortunately, it's not available in sheet film yet. Maybe it never will be. I don't know. But I've used that in that smaller format. I've also shot some, is it the Fuji 160S negative yep. sheet film? That was quite a nice film. I was using that actually more when I was doing commercial work, when I was doing interiors and exteriors, like obviously the dynamic range that I got with color neg film. So I was using that more on the commercial side than I have been for my landscapes. Very interesting. So let's talk about your favorite acquisition when it comes to black and white. There's lots of black and white stock. You can still get lots of different things from T-Max to Tri-X to this to that. Fuji has their stuff. I mean, it's all great. Any film is great. I mean, if we can still buy it, it's great stuff. But what do you like to use when you're out there shooting black and white? Right now, I've got a real affection for the T-Max 100. And I spent a lot of time testing that film. And I found you can really, what I call, bully it. You can send it off to N plus one territory. You can bring it down in plus two, and although it was difficult to process because you had to be consistent in your processing, it really gave a wonderful result. And I still use a bit of Tri-X, but that T-Max 100 sheet film is, for me, the primary 4x5 film I'm using right now for black and white. 
And I developed that in Tmax RS Developer. And I'm finding that in that developer, I'm able to keep it at a 100 speed. So it's fairly fast for a large film. No, that is great stuff. And like you said, if you keep everything consistent and you've tested yours and you know what's up, you can keep things consistent across the board. And it's just a beautiful piece of emulsion. It's very cool. I found it scans quite well. I do my own scanning. And the scanner, I have an Imacon, a FlexTite 848. And I found the grain of the Triax to be a little bit coarse where the grain of the T-Max, when I scan it on that particular scanner, just easier to work with, so just a nicer result at the end of the day on my prints. Wow, very, very cool. So let's talk about what does Joseph want to do moving forward? I mean, you're out and you've been shooting this stuff out in the middle of nowhere for many, many years. What are you looking forward to photographically that you haven't been able to do yet? Is there some challenge? Is there somewhere you want to go? When are you going to trek off to Everest? Well, there's still numerous places that I'm itching to get into out this way. And so I've got a little book that I've kept cataloging these areas. And when I'm not carrying my 4 by 5 when I'm out there climbing or hiking, usually you'll come across an area and I say, oh, I'm going to come back to this with my camera one day. So I've got a long list of destinations that I want to reach close by here. And so I had a chance to visit Zion, and I've just found that park to be absolutely gorgeous. So I'd love to go down there and shoot that when there's some nice fresh snow and some real dramatic storms around. Do you find, Joe, that you're leaning more towards liking to shoot winter landscapes? Do you like exposing for snow? Tell us about that. Because of the limited season here, I mean, basically there's four or five weeks of summer. It snows almost all year round in the mountains. So it tends to be something that I've gotten used to and I really like being in. And exposing for it, what I've learned is Astia does a pretty nice job If I put the snow highlights on a zone 7, by accident, they might end up as a zone 8, but I can still print them quite well. With black and white film, I could expose the snow for zone 7, zone 7.5, and and if I want to push it a little further, then I'll use the selenium intensification formula that Ansel Adams has in his publication, and they may be able to push that a little bit higher. So I just find that like those landscapes the most, because all around you, certain times of the year for one thing, And also that when they're rendered in a print, those whites can be just very stunning. Right, but also a very difficult challenge at that also. Especially in an inkjet, especially in a digital (laughs) and a hybrid workflow, as you well know. Well, I used to do some traditional printing and fiber-based black and white printing. I still do it from time to time. But I honestly like that new exhibition fiber paper that Epson has made. And it's just a little bit easier to work with. And I used to say, there's no curl in the paper. So true. So are you processing all your black and white with a jobo? Are you doing the stuff by hand? Are you doing a tray? Are you hanging the stuff? How are you processing your 4x5? I'm using a jobo expert drum, and I have a jobo processor. I'm not sure the model off the top of my head, but I am using that for all my film processing, whether it be black and white sheet film and black and white 120. I don't do my own E6 at this time. I have that externally run for me, but I find that jobo does a wonderful job at film processing. And I have not had a single sheet of 4x5 that has ever had a streak or a watermark on it. It's just been absolutely immaculate. So it's wonderful stuff. Wow. And there's nothing like blowing that drum lid off at the end of the rug. That is true. It is pretty cool. Do you find that there's adequate E6 capability in town where you're at? Not for sheet film. I do have to ship that to Vancouver. Locally, though, E6 for 120 film is still available. There are a lot of wedding photographers and a lot of commercial photographers that still use the 120 films. So E6 is still supported here in that format, but unfortunately not in the 4x5 size. Yeah, it's too bad you got to send it out. You should start souping that stuff yourself. One day I will. I just shoot so little. One of the things that I look at is I call it sheet film worthiness. Of course, that's a takeoff from the Seinfeld episode. I don't know if you've ever seen that one where Elaine is trying to buy up all these contraceptive devices. Yep. So for me, the image has to be sheet film worthy before I even put a sheet in the camera. And what I'm looking for is the elements of composition and light and detail and so forth. And there are often times when I come to a spot, I'll set everything up, and it's just not what I want. And what I want at the end of the day is a big print. For me, it's about creating a print that somebody can put on their wall in their living room and that they could be in awe by looking at this thing. So that type of image, I don't come across that all that often. So I'll often go out and like maybe they'll come back with one or two images. So for color, that's certainly not a lot of color film to be sitting around waiting to be processed. 
No, like you said, not worth it at that point. You might as well, just, like you said, send it off. It was yeah. back, all done. Yeah, if I'm able in a season to shoot a little more, it would make more sense for me to do it myself. But this year, I think I've only shot maybe four sheets of color film, unfortunately. Wow, you yeah, need to go south. Been, yeah, it's been an unusual fall. I mean, it was wonderful, but not great for photography, unfortunately. No, no, I mean, like you said, if everything's in covered in snow and you have three or four or five weeks and you go out multiple times and you don't get anything worth anything, well, what are you going to do? Yeah, chalk it up to experience. So tell me your most hairy experience being out in the middle of nowhere by yourself. Well, this was a real dumb thing to do. I was going to ski into this high plateau in Yoho, and it was late October, and it was a really snowy year. So I had my skis, and I started at about, I think it was about 1 o'clock in the morning from the parking lot, and I started heading up there by headlamp, and the snow was getting deeper and deeper, and I was breaking trail. And I don't know if I mentioned, but it was like minus 23. 23 Celsius. 23 Celsius. So when you're getting that cold, it's almost close (laughs) to Fahrenheit. They almost converge when you get into those load numbers. My water froze. My food had frozen. Everything was frozen, unfortunately. And uh, I got to the place where I wanted to about four hours late, and I realized that I was going to be in trouble if I kept on going. So I did actually manage to shoot some black and white, and I started making my way back, and then I just ran out of gas. And I think it had a lot to do with not having any water for nine hours, not having any food. And you felt like those climbers on Everest, you always wondered, how can they actually just run out of steam? Man, I just felt that. I just had no energy. And lo and behold, you just must draw your strength and keep going. But that was probably one of the most hairiest times that I've ever had in the backcountry. Right, because like you said, you're there, man. That's you. I always thought, well, this is the one time where I would actually call it in. I would call my <laughs> wife, send somebody with a snowmobile. Your wife doesn't go with you, though, either, right? She stays at home and says, good luck. I hope you come back. Make sure the policy is paid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you don't have a sat phone? I don't, know. There are these devices now that you can buy that will send out an emergency signal. Yep. But no, I just haven't carried one, so. Wow. I just hope I don't get into that kind of trouble. Sounds like a good Christmas present, a good sat phone. They're a lot cheaper now than they used to be. You can buy a phone card. You don't have to use all the minutes at once, and it lasts for a certain amount of time. True. Well, how often can you call your buddies when you're out in the middle of nowhere and it takes you four days to hike in? Dude, it's really quiet up here. Well, okay, well, there you go. (laughs) Tell me about your thought process behind these big prints. Do you find that if your prints were smaller, they would be more intimate? Do you think they're better, bigger because of this, the grandioso monster landscape? What's your thought process on these big prints versus doing 8x10s or 11x14s or even 1620s? You're doing 30x40s and biggers. So what do you think about the big print versus the intimacy of the small print? Or does the big print pull you in enough? It's just so detailed and so unbelievable that it just draws you in. I think that is a fairly accurate way to describe it. I have printed some of my images small, and I just found that they didn't work. They didn't have that same aesthetic feel to them. When I've printed them large, they just seem to have a much greater impact. There was more going on in the print. You can follow it around. I just found the larger prints rendered that subject a little better than a smaller print did. Actually, the biggest I'm going right now is 24 by 30. Just because any bigger than that becomes quite difficult in terms of framing, weight. I find that people that I'm selling to, that's kind of the maximum size that they can readily fit into a space in their homes. And I don't have too many requests for going any bigger than that. But I won't go smaller either. I just find that smaller just doesn't lend itself, in my color work especially, to the subject. Have you played with the hybrid workflow in regards to your black and white, or is black and white still going to get silver paper and that's it? No, I started to print on the exhibition fiber, mostly from the T-Max negatives. I just find that result to be quite nice. And I'm moving more towards that because, I mean, there's a convenience of working in Photoshop. Obviously, it's a lot easier than in traditional darkroom. And the results have been quite pleasing with that paper. The climate here is very dry. And paper curl was always just the real issue printing on traditional fiber paper. Do you find you're using any additional software besides Photoshop to complete these hybrid images that you're shooting? No, I'm not very savvy on the software side. And this is probably one of the reasons why I'm not bracing digital to the degree of other photographers. I just find I use the scanning software that comes with the Imicon, which I believe is FlexColor. And then I work with the image in Photoshop. And then that's it. Those are the two primary programs that I use. Joe, what would you say would be a good tip for somebody that wants to get into doing landscape photography like you're doing? And of course, there's not too many people out there that would have enough intestinal fortitude to go after the degree that you are, especially looking at some of the images of you hanging off the side of ice. 
going way off the deep end, but I mean, how could someone get into this type of work without basically trucking off to Everest? Well, come visit the Canadian Rockies from the start. <laughs> there are really a lot of places that you can access here quite easily. Not all of it is as extreme as you describe. There's a real nice network of trails. There's some valleys in the fall, which are just stunningly beautiful. And with a little blood, sweat, and tears, you can get up there with your camera and spend a great day shooting. It's not as difficult to access as some of the other places that I've been to, that's for sure. Do you find that you could still create beautiful images if you were shooting 35, an old Mamiya twin lens? Does it really matter about the gear? That's a good question, Scott. I mean, I do have a Mamiya 7.2, which I take with me when I'm climbing. And I have taken quite a number of decent images with that smaller camera. But there's something about working with a view camera that you just can't get with any other camera. And of course, that is looking at the image in the ground glass, working with the movements of the camera and adjusting the tilts and shifts and so forth. And that's just an experience that you just don't get with any other camera. And I think that's just part of the fun. Sure. Makes you slow down a bit. And I guess in the locations and especially in the winter areas that you're at, slow sometimes is very safe. Sometimes it's the only way you can work. I don't know if you ever set up a tripod, and I don't actually go out in the late winter when the snow is at its maximum depth because I've skied into an area and I've stretched out the tripod legs, put it in the snow, and basically the tripod head is at the level of the snow. It's like, great, now I'm going to have to work on my knees. And, of course, as soon as you take your skis off, you're in up to your waist in snow, and so it's just damn hard. Yeah, but the images are stunning. I mean, the stuff's beautiful. What can you say? Oh, thank you, Scott. No guts, no glory, right? Oh, that's true enough. So the one trip here, is there anywhere you want to go in the Canadian Rockies that you're going to have to, like, take a week to trek in? What about taking a helicopter into this stuff? Is that cool? I mean, do people do that? Unfortunately, in the national parks, you're not allowed to access these places by helicopter. Some of the provincial parks, you can. And Mount Assiniboine, for example, is one provincial park, which is a really incredible place. One of these years, I will go in there and just bite the bullet and load up a duffel bag with film and then fly in and spend a week in there, because it is a truly remarkable place. Yeah, this is great stuff. So, Joseph, again, let's talk about your website, where they can go look at this work and see what you're up to. Sure, my website is Joseph Cruz, that's K-U-R-U-C-Z, one word, dot C-A, and I have both a color portfolio and some black and white work on there right now. And you're shooting some kids. I do a little bit of that on the side, mostly for friends. I'm often asked to do that work, and I do like it. I do have that Pentex 672 that I keep kicking around. Yep. And I'll load that with Fuji 400H, and that's a nice combination. It's fun. you got to be able to shoot stuff, and like you said, in the deep of winter, there's still people that are warm enough to shoot, so it's too cold to go out in the middle of the backwoods. It's great stuff, and Joe, I really appreciate it. This is just beautiful photography, and great to hear about your story and what you're up to. These places that you're venturing out to get this photography that basically not very many people anywhere, even if you live there in Alberta, get to go see. I'm sure most people don't trek out to where you're going. Well, thank you, Scott. And I've been really lucky that I've had a chance to do this. Yeah, it's great stuff. And I definitely look forward to chatting again. And I really appreciate it, buddy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Scott. Well, there you go. Joseph Cruz, unbelievable photography. Makes you want to grab your view camera and just trek 40 miles into the backwoods to take photographs like Joseph's grabbing because this is unbelievable work. You really got to give it to this guy of how the extreme that he goes to catch these photographs in these unbelievable locations. This is just beautiful work and very inspiring. You got to check out his website. It's beautiful stuff. The Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful over at www.fujifilmusa.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab at richardphotolab.com. DR5 over at www.dr5.com. Iger Studios over at igerstudios.com, Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com, and of course, our media partners, APUG, the Analog Photography User Group over at www.apug.org, our photography philanthropy partners, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film over at www.geh.org. I've been your host, Scott Chipper, here on Inside Analog Photography Radio. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography.